Hey, Rebecca. Yes, JB. Did you know that today's guest is Valerie Oberling? Yes, I did know that. Okay, but did you also know that Valerie Oberly was the first female executive at Walt Disney Parks and Resorts? I think I did know that. Uh huh. Okay, okay, but that's not all. There's more. I bet you also didn't know that when Valerie Oberly was a leader at Disney, there was a rumor that she had a very loyal, almost cult like following. Okay. And you want to know how I know that? Uh, yeah. I was one of the followers. I knew it. You were in a cult. No. It was a very loyal, almost cult-like following, and it's also possible that I started the rumor. Today's guest is Valerie Oberly, former executive at the Walt Disney World Resort, and we're going to learn more about her life, her leadership, and how to build a culture. Welcome. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. And I'm your host, Rebecca Morgan. In this series, we bring you conversations with experienced leaders. Because a leader is anyone who influences change, we want to understand not just what leaders do, but who they are and how they can be effective in a rapidly changing world. We hope you'll learn some things about our guests, about our topic, and also about yourself. This is Leadership Life Stories. You can find episodes of this and all other Victor Media Group shows on our website at victormediagroup.co. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and connect with us on your favorite social media platform. We'll be right back after this important message. Well, hi there, listeners. It's Rebecca Morgan. If you told my younger self you are going to love talking about leadership, and when you grow up, you will lead hundreds and develop thousands of managers and leaders and create great places to work, I would have laughed at the idea because I was focused on becoming a dolphin trainer. Yeah, while I still love dolphins, what I really love to do is leadership development. So much so that I created the Awesome Leader League, the ultimate collection of people-centered leadership skills to help you be a better leader. If you're looking for ways to become more confident in an effective people-centered leader that people will trip over their own feet to follow, this is your resource. And did I mention we do it in 20 minutes or less? Join us now at theawesomeleaderleague.com. Welcome to Leadership Life Stories. I'm Rebecca Morgan, and my co-host is J.B. Adams. This season of Leadership Life Stories is focusing on examining Disney leadership at the Walt Disney World Resort as it celebrates its 50th anniversary. This is part one of a two-part interview with Valerie Oberly, who was a cast member when the resort opened in 1971 and performed many different roles in the company and holds the distinction of being the first female executive in the Walt Disney Parks organization. She currently serves as a CEO of the Oberly Group, where she and her husband Spencer provide advice and consulting to business leaders to help them implement strategies and to ensure a culture of excellence. And in this segment, we ask Valerie Oberly to share her leadership philosophy, to explain why being a leader at Disney is a big deal, and to share her best examples of Disney leadership. Valerie Oberly, welcome to the show. Thank you, JB. It's just a pleasure to be on with you. So let's start by asking Valerie, just in general, what's your leadership philosophy? My philosophy was and always has been about developing other people trying to look for the treasures in people, going treasure hunting, and helping those individuals to achieve their highest potential. That's what I enjoyed so much about my work at Walt Disney World. Hey, Valerie, some skeptics might say this is not a big deal. So what? You led a team at an amusement park at Walt Disney World, which is part of the travel, <laughs> leisure, and entertainment industry. Is it important? It, oh, it's so important. Disney has the worldwide well-earned reputation of being one of the finest, highest quality park experiences in the world, Walt Disney World and all of our theme parks, and certainly all of our movies and consumer products. We've always had high standards and people expect a lot from us. So it's really important in being a leader in that kind of business to set the right example and to promote the involvement of our cast members and helping them to be their best, helping our company to be the best and deliver the best guest experience. It's particularly important right now, coming out of a year and a half of COVID experience, people want to travel, but they're still, their expectations are still high. And especially coming to a Disney theme park, 
I read so many articles during COVID about how people thought, well, Disney's going to be doing it right. You hear comments like that and it makes you proud. And it also makes you know that you, you have to set that example. You have to kind of raise the bar in everything that you do. And Disney is still an example of the best uh, experience in travel and leisure. In your introduction, we acknowledge that you were the first female executive in Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, and that you earned this when you were promoted to the director of the Disney University in 1985. Now, what does it mean to you when people say you broke the glass ceiling, that you're a barrier breaker? Is that something you set out to do? Rebecca, I did not set out to do it. And being a barrier breaker, I didn't, I didn't really recognize it as that. Those terms, the glass ceiling terms, weren't around in the 70s and 80s. So... I, I knew just by some of the feedback that I was getting from people, particularly other women, that, wow, you know, you have broken through a barrier that none of, of the others of us have been able to do yet. And then others pretty quickly started, started to happen. And when I heard that from a number of people, that's when I realized how important it was for me to set that good example and be that woman that people would admire and want to be mentored by um, because of the role that I played. So I did get a lot of feedback from a variety of people about that. I just didn't set out to do that. All right, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is about defining Disney leadership. So Valerie, in your experience, what is a Disney leader? How would you define it? I think a Disney leader is and should be someone who genuinely cares about the people they have the privilege to lead, that they feel that sense of connection with them and they want them to be their best. They should be smart. They should be able to do the budget and deliver the results, absolutely, make solid decisions, be good communicators, but they can be all of those things. And if they don't genuinely care about the people that work with them, then they're not going to be good leaders. And we saw that coming and going. I would promote various people that I thought would be good leaders. And they were very competent at what they were doing. But when they became a leader, it, it didn't work. Some of them self-selected out. Others, you know, we had to move to individual contributor position. But that care genuinely, authentically caring about your people. Mm -hmm. And that... Also, I guess maybe it's an obvious statement. They need to care about our guests and have that sense of, wow, I can't wait to create a fabulous guest experience. My team and I are going to do that together. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for us? So that, that would be my definition of that. Did you have a Disney leadership role model? Yes, I had several. Probably the biggest mentor, Dick Nunes, was the president of Walt Disney Attractions. He started with Walt in Disneyland in 1955 at the Disney University. But when I was a young assistant supervisor, Dick gave me some advice that stuck with me. And I tried to emulate this with my staff as they came along, but I called it the walk down Main Street. I was literally uh, walking down Main Street in the Magic Kingdom in the summer of 1972. I had just been promoted to attraction supervisor, and I look up, and it's Dick Nunes, president of Walt Disney Attractions, Disneyland and Walt Disney World. And I knew him very well. He looked down, and he said, oh, congratulations, young lady. Didn't I read that you were just promoted into supervision? I said, yes, I certainly was. And he could tell I was, you know, a little bit nervous. But he didn't make you feel intimidated when you were talking with him. But he said, do you mind if I walk with you down Main Street and just share some of my philosophy about what it means to be a leader in this company? And I thought, oh, my gosh, absolutely. I mean, this, I remember this as though it were yesterday. And when I walked down Main Street in the Magic Kingdom, anytime I visited since then, it's a time machine for me, total time machine. So he said, Valerie, you now have the opportunity to serve your cast members so they will serve our guests. He said it very precisely, very slowly, he looked at me and I'm nodding. 
And he said, let me say that again. <laughs> you have the opportunity. He didn't say as part of that, and I could take it away from you, but there was, you know, some strength in what he said. The opportunity to serve our cast members so they may serve our guests. And by that, I mean, hire good people, train them well, train them, train them, train them, provide the right resources for them to do their job. Be clear about what you expect. Give them good feedback. You know, coach them to be their best and celebrate with them when they are. So you have that opportunity and I hope you will take that seriously. You are now becoming a role model of the Disney culture and what we stand for and how we treat our people. And that again was one of those, whoa, okay, what a responsibility on my shoulders, which I was very excited to accept. And he chatted about a couple of other things and said, okay, um, I'm here for you. You know, anytime you need me, I'm here for you. And he buzzed off, walked really fast and took off in a different direction. So I pondered that as I completed my walk of the Magic Kingdom, you know, picking up a piece of trash or speaking with the guests or checking on guided tours and thought, wow, okay, this is very different from what I thought. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am not here to boss people around, tell them what to do. I am here to serve them. And that's a real shift. For someone young like I was, it, just shifting my mind in that moment, okay, all right, I get it. What Then it became important for me to say to my cast members, what do you need for me to do your job? And what's getting in your way of being the best you can be? So I felt that strong sense of responsibility to be a role model at that um, very young age. That was just huge. Okay, Rebecca, let's reflect on what we just heard. Uh, what did you think about what Valerie Oberly said about leadership? You know, Jamie, I really couldn't agree more with Valerie that leadership is all about people. Many times people are promoted because they're really good at their job. And then what they forget once they're promoted when they're in that leadership job is that they are now responsible for the people and not the task. So take care of your people. Yeah, very much. I, I feel the same way. My takeaway is that uh, Disney leaders are not all that different from leaders in other organizations. But what makes a Disney leader effective is that they need to care about people. And the reason for this is because the organization is all about customer service. And so when you need to have an organization that supports the customer experience, then leaders have to set the example, right? When we come back, we'll learn more about Valerie Oberly's backstory and the early signs that she might be a leader. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back to Leadership Life Stories. I'm Rebecca Morgan. My co-host is JB Adams. Our guest is Valerie Oberly, former vice president of Disney University at the Walt Disney World Resort and currently the CEO of the Oberly Group. This segment is all about the early influences that inspire leadership. We will welcome Valerie Oberly's backstory in just a moment. But first, of course, JB wants to analyze the guest personality. Yes, I do. <laughs> Leadership Life Stories presents the Self-Awareness Quiz, featuring the five-factor model that measures the five personality traits of openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Remember, leadership begins with self-awareness and you can't change your personality as much as you can manage it. So let's take a little time and get to know our guest. Valerie Oberly, are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it on. The first one is openness. Do you consider yourself creative or practical? Creative. Number two, conscientiousness. Do you consider yourself disciplined or flexible? Definitely flexible. With regard to extroversion, do you consider yourself introverted or extroverted? Extroverted. We knew that one. With regard yeah. to agreeableness, do you consider yourself <laughs> compliant or challenging? Um, <laughs> I'm not compliant. 
<laughs> I, I do things legally correct and follow safety rules and things that are really important. But I prefer not to be that way. I would rather be challenging and saying, well, you say we can't do it this way. Why not? Why don't we try this or try mm. that? And the fifth one is neuroticism. Do you consider yourself sensitive or steady? I'm sensitive. So I'm going to read this back. Valerie Overly, you said that you are a creative, flexible, extroverted, challenging, and sensitive leader. What do you think that this makes you suited for? And what are some environments that you're probably not suited for? That's a, a great question, especially asking me now after all of these years, mm -hmm. because I've done a variety of things in my career, both at Disney, many, many things. And then since leaving Disney, tried various consulting concepts and training programs and a variety of, of approaches to it. So I think what I am well suited for, someone with this personality style, is to be a leader in an organization that values their people first. Mm -hmm. Their people first leads to their, their guests being valued. Uh, has, you know, the ability to work within an environment and be flexible to the changing times because environments shift and change all the time faster now than ever before. So I know that that kind of environment and being a leader, I end up stepping up in my volunteer work. Mm -hmm. um, just about any group that I'm, I'm around, I'm the one that goes, oh, okay, I'll take charge and I I, I know that about myself. I like to be a leader. I like to organize talents and put things together. I know also about myself that I could never work in a backstage, if you will, office as an individual contributor, producing reports and budgets, even though I can do those. But uh, I would not be good at it at all. And um, I would probably get fired. So <laughs> uh, I got fired once from a job in a insurance company before computerized files and I was in the fire file department in a basement and I had you know n through p alphabet and filed papers and all these manila envelopes and all these shelves oh my god it was awful uh, so I got fired so anyway, that's where was... that's where you knew you didn't belong right <laughs> and by the way I would say getting fired great experience everyone should try it uh, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It teaches you a lot, actually. Valerie, let's learn more about your early years. Where were you born and raised? Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. What generation do you identify with? Definitely the baby boomer generation. How many siblings do you have and what's your birth order? Um, I'm the oldest and my brother is 17 months younger. And what were your parents' occupations? My dad was uh, worked for the railway company. Mom was a homemaker at the time. They were both in the Royal Canadian Air Force before getting married and having me. So um, we had that kind of in our background. All of my parents' siblings and parents all lived in Edmonton, so we were all very close. Lots of family get-togethers. When I was seven, um, dad decided that he was tired of the cold weather and wanted to move south. His sister had moved to Southern California. So he literally packed up a trunk, a big trunk, with whatever belongings they had in our clothes, one trunk, my brother and I, and we moved to Southern California. We took the train down from Edmonton to LA and stayed with my aunt for a couple of nights and got our own little one bedroom apartment. Okay, what was your role in the family? <laughs> boss, bossy boss. Um, my, um, very much like my dad was. He was uh, very strong, but I still am and was. Um, like, let, let's get things done. Let's just do it. Let's get out there and do it. So I know that about my personality style. I'm, I'm a driver. Um, you know, I, I want to get it done, and I tend to move very fast. Valerie, let's learn more about how you got to Disney. Certainly, that was another. Very cool, unexpected adventure. I was going to community college, wanted to be a nurse, was working in a um, nursing home as a receptionist, but enjoyed the patients so much 
that I would take each one of them their mail and deliver it and chat with them. I helped put them to bed at night. And of course, the nurses always gave me the dirty diapers to change, but I didn't care because I was helping people and I, I enjoyed that. So I was dating a guy named Jim who worked in uh, Tomorrowland Foods at Disneyland. And he came over to my apartment one day. We were going to go out and he said, hey, they've just asked me uh, at work if I want to go to Walt Disney World in Florida. They're building a new theme park and they want me to be the supervisor of Fantasyland Foods. I said, wow, well, that sounds pretty cool, Jim. You know, I'm just, okay. And he said, so, uh, like, do you want to get married and go with me? And um, I, I think we said we loved each other, but you know, I was 21. Um, and I said, Valerie, sure. no, no offense to Jim, but that's one of the most awkward marriage proposals I, I can, was think totally. I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, no, it was totally. Yeah, uh, it, it was. And that was exactly, <laughs> in, exactly what he said. So um, I said, sure. Okay. That sounds like fun. You know, when do we go? And he said, well, we have to be there in February. So we, I think this was probably around November. We got married in January, went up to Big Bear Lake in the mountains in Southern California, and then drove across country. Was the plan that you were going to get a job at Disney or you were just going to come along on this ride? No, I wanted to get a job. I actually, what I first did was start to look up where nursing schools were. I wanted to go to school. And then Jim said, why don't you come and get a job at Disney? You know, they're looking for people. So, and because spouses came with their husbands or wives. Um, they had probably a little bit of a, a one up on everybody to get a job, but I got hired as a department clerk typist, got that job and still kept thinking about nursing school. But, you know, it was February 71. So we opened in 71 and because Jim was there, he was, oh my gosh, we, he worked, you know, seven days a week for months and months and months. And we were caught up in, you know, the excitement of opening Walt Disney World. And then you know, it just, I got hooked on everything. So uh, that was how I got there. And um, Jim and I were married for seven years and he left and he went to Tokyo and then opened a restaurant in um, Southern Florida. And I met Spencer at the Polynesian Hotel when I moved over there. Now, for the sake of your story, I just want to say thanks, Jim, because otherwise you might not have made it to Florida. Yeah. So I'm very That's grateful true. that you said yes to his Thank you. Proposition. Thank you. Yeah. It, I mean, what an adventure to leave Southern California in the comfort of home and uh, to move. So that, that was great. Um, I appreciated that I had that opportunity and I, maybe I thanked him. I don't know. He did take credit for it quite often. You wouldn't be anything if it weren't for me bringing you here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I want to go back to something you just said a moment ago. Uh, this is kind of tying a bow on the conversation about your personality and leadership. And this could turn into a debate. I'm not sure. But um, I just want to ask, leaders are born or made? Okay. My personal opinion is they're born. And the reason I say that, it's not just a, you know, a whim in my head. After studying leadership, so many books, so many classes, so many concepts, and I've seen the debate on both sides, but I believe they're born because you start to show your natural leadership talents at a very early age, six, seven, eight years old. I mean, I started bossing mom around when I was three and bossing around isn't the right term to really define leadership, but um, seeing the need to get something done. And I believe that there are people who don't discover that leadership trait or talent until sometimes later in their careers. And because no one has helped them to see that talent. So I believe leaders are born. JB, let's reflect on what we just heard. What do you think of Valerie's backstory? All right. I did not know that she wanted to study nursing, but as she described it, I realized that that made total sense because she has a very nurturing personality and that kind of uh, informs her approach to leadership. The thing that got my attention was this. I was shocked 
to hear her say that she thought that leaders were born and not made. And, and I, you know, that's why we asked the question is to, to ha kind of have that debate. But that really surprised me. What did you think? Yeah, you know, I was really surprised as well to her response to that question, are leaders born or made? Not what I was expecting at all. Regardless, you know, if you believe leaders are born or made, the truth is you have to have the desire to lead. Yeah, I totally agree. Our guest is Valerie Oberly, and when we come back, she will share memories from Walt Disney World and discuss the evolution of Disney leadership over time. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Leadership Life Stories. I'm JB Adams. My co-host is Rebecca Morgan, and our guest is Valerie Oberly, former vice president of the Disney University and current CEO of the Oberly Group. In a moment, we're going to hear about Valerie Oberly's thoughts on the evolution of Disney leadership. But before we do that, we have a little free association fun. <laughs> The sound of the train whistle means it's time to play Walt Disney World Insider Free Association. This is the game where there are no right or wrong answers. There are no winners, no losers, and there are no prizes. No so prize. to play the game, we are going to provide you, Valerie, with a series of prompts about your Walt Disney World experience. And for each one, you say the very first answer that pops into your head. Okay, are you ready, Valerie, to play? I am ready. Yay! Good. First question, favorite Disney character? Winnie the Pooh. Wonderful. Favorite Walt Disney World theme park? It's gotta be the Magic Kingdom. Favorite Walt Disney World resort? The Polynesian Village Resort. <laughs> because that was the first resort I've worked in, and because I have such fond memories of the cast members there, meeting Spencer there. Favorite attraction that's still operating? Probably Pirates of the Caribbean. Favorite attraction that's no longer operating? Oh, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Yes! <laughs> Motor Mania is not a crime! I I'm with know. you, Valerie. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> Anything at Walt Disney World overrated? Yeah, I'm gonna narrow it down. Um, and this, this may seem a little bit odd to you, but the shooting gallery. Oh! Anything at Walt Disney World that's underrated? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> the Swiss Family Treehouse. I, I was always entranced by that. <laughs> this is the last one. Exclusive backstage secret. The backstage secret is knowing the numbers of the buildings above and the doors that you need to access in the tunnel to get yes! to that. So, M07 below Main Street, you have to know the MO door numbers. MO5, MO7, if you don't know them, you get totally lost. All right, Valerie Oberly, thank you for playing Walt Disney World Insider Free Association. You didn't win anything, but we had a good time. Okay, in a moment, we are gonna talk about the evolution of Disney leadership and how to build a very loyal following. She's going to mention a few things that we need to set up. Yes, uh, earlier she mentioned Dick Nunes, who was president of Walt Disney Attractions and later chairman, and he was the top leader of theme parks and resorts. She will also mention Michael Eisner, who was the CEO of the Walt Disney Company starting in the mid 1980s, along with Frank Wells, who was the president of the company at the same time. And another name you will hear is Judson Green. He was the chief financial officer of the Walt Disney Company and then was promoted to become president of theme parks and attractions in the 1990s. And he led the cultural transformation in theme parks and resorts that was called Performance Excellence. And you're going to hear about that again throughout all of these interviews. Hey, Valerie, we want to get your perspective on Disney leadership over time. From your experience, how has Disney leadership changed and what styles have become more or less prevalent? Oh, <laughs> uh, another excellent question. And leadership styles definitely evolved, not only at Disney, but in other companies. And I think they needed to. I was at Walt Disney World most of the time, you know, later in the 80s, ended up being corporate. But the type of leadership that we had in the 70s was much more autocratic, much more. It wasn't participative. 
It was not servant leadership. Even though Dick would say those things to us about you serve your people, he was still as an executive autocratic. Mm -hmm. And we knew where we stood with things. That's what I liked. Everything was on the table. If your boss wasn't happy with you, you knew it. They may not have always been so kind with their words. They may have said, you know, you did this wrong. So that part I liked, that honesty. Moving into the 80s, still some of that exists. And then towards the 90s, we became much more of a participative management style and more diplomatic about things. And when Judson Green came in, his style was completely different. He was younger. He really wanted input from people. And he looked at things in a different way, which was good. And we launched a whole new plan for development of our staff and our way of thinking around achieving high goals. And it was called performance excellence. So I was right in the middle of the whole thing when it was going on. And what was great about it in my mind, and I still share this with other clients, is that it clarified the expectations. We'd been through the training. We knew what Disney stood for. And because so many of us had been around for so long, it was just kind of ingrained and it was natural. We brought a lot of new people in, in the late 80s from the outside, uh, running hotels. As our hotels expanded, water parks opened, it changed the structure of leadership and it changed the culture somewhat. And we had to be more specific. So we had to be clear about the behaviors we expected mm -hmm. uh, that people demonstrated while producing the results. Both were important and we were measured on that. So it was more of a very clear directive about what needed to happen. And we had feedback from 360 feedback and the training to support us moving in a better direction if we needed to. So I appreciated that. And that I, I really look back and think that was a, a good change to make. Now, Valerie, that, I hear two things. The clear expectations didn't change. Right. Mm -hmm. so that was always the same. But in the That's 70s, it. you <clears throat> said that we had an autocratic style. Mm -hmm. But I also am hearing you, that you're saying we needed an autocratic style at that time. We didn't mm -hmm. need that in the 90s. So tell us what, why it was needed. Why was autocratic needed in the 70s? Why was it not needed in the 1990s? Well, first of all, I think it had to do with the uh, generation being the baby boomer generation and some older coming from Disneyland. And that style worked then mm -hmm. in a lot of workplaces. And because we were just opening a huge park with hotels and campground and so many new things, I think our top managers, executives felt like they needed to be more autocratic. This is not up for a vote. Everybody mm -hmm. doesn't get a uh, a vote in this. It's not democratic. So that was to help the clear expectations. But at the same time, the style um, sometimes was abrasive. And, you know, there was some cussing and yelling sometimes and people didn't might, always treat you with respect. And that, that might make it harder for you to go out and smile. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And of course, we had the uh, philosophy that you leave your problems in backstage mm -hmm. or at home. When you're on stage delivering the show, you had to smile. Yeah. And I think our generation, too, was more used to that. And I think we, we needed to be more open, a little more flexible. And we needed that change in style in the 90s, even though we were still growing, because of the generational changes that were coming about. And also treating people with more respect. I'm very curious. Makes sense everything that you said about the 1970s. When there was a change at the very top with Michael Eisner and Frank Wells about 1983 or 84, in the years subsequent to that, did you see any changes in leadership style from what you had seen before? Um, I did. And the way I saw it, and I was there in front of the castle when Michael and Frank came and greeted everyone. It was all pretty exciting. Um, Michael, particularly, because of his creativity, he appreciated that. But Michael, as the overall leader, he kind of opened the doors. He, in fact, we used to say Michael just sort of kicked open the doors of creativity. There had been 
plans on the drawing board for a number of years for new hotels that just couldn't be done. Well, then all of a sudden, the you know, Grand Floridian gets to be built. And then there was Port Orleans and Caribbean Beach and expansions of the existing hotels. So things started to change and open up with that. And both Spencer and I have had the good fortune to have been in meetings with Michael and pitching different ideas. And Spencer particularly pitching an entire new fourth floor of the Contemporary Resort and a new merchandise shops and all kinds of things that Michael loved. So he was kind of hands-on when it came to that. He liked to pick out the decor in the guest room so they would do sample rooms for him. Say, here's the bedspread and here, because he just had that knack and, and that love for it. And that said a lot to those of us that heard those stories. Okay, he is paying attention to those details. So he still cared a lot about those details. And he he was kind of like a little kid, you know, real tall, wears baseball cap and kind of laugh and joke. And he was rather humble. But kind of fun to be in meetings with because he he was very open and very um, courteous. Frank Wells was the opposite of him. Um, also a great guy, so smart, moved fast, top, top, top. I gave a presentation to Frank once on PowerPoint about our cast member satisfaction survey. And I'd been warned, thank goodness. And I'd have a slide up and I'd talk and he'd go, got it. Got it, got it. So when he said that, it meant click, go, shut up, go. So it, the style between Frank and Michael, there was a, a difference in styles, but I think from the creativity standpoint, the doors were kicked open. So Valerie, I want to acknowledge that in our show opening, which you may or may not have heard, I mentioned that there was a rumor that when you were at Disney, you had a very loyal, almost cult-like following and I was one of the followers. Um, so what do you think of this rumor? And if it was true, how does a leader get that going? Thank you for saying that. Um, <laughs> you, if you want, you can, you can like be president of my fan club. <laughs> I, I would gladly I think, do that. I, <laughs> um, I did not think of it that way, of course. I just enjoyed our team so much. And luckily, I had the opportunity, the privilege to interview everyone that joined our team. So I could feel whether or not they were going to be a good cultural fit with what we were doing and our level of expectation. Um, gosh, for a couple of years there, we had no turnover just mm -hmm. at the Disney University or when we um, merged to the professional development programs before Disney Institute. We just had the best team ever. And I think part of it was that very personal connection. And if I may add one thing, um, when you work in Disney University professional development programs, later Disney Institute, we always used to say that we were on stage preaching the gospel about the Disney approach. And what I have said for these past almost 25 years now, when you believe it, it's easy to preach. And you believe it when you see it working. Yes. Thank you, JB. That was... That was so kind of you to say. Um, and I felt the same way. We had, it was, it was home for us. I looked forward to going to work. Um, when we moved off property, had an office out near SeaWorld at Westwood, we had a big open area. There were a ring of offices around the outside on the windows, but the rest of it was all open. I grabbed a couple of our guys. We went to um, Home Depot and we bought patio furniture, mm -hmm. tables, chairs, and umbrellas. And we set them up. We created a patio. So in the morning, you could see people having a cup of coffee, sitting, chatting, catching up um, on the patio. We often ate lunch there. We had different events. Any new cast member that joined our team, everybody would be there to greet them so that they would immediately feel embraced by all of us. And that, um, that JBI, would be the way I would define how we... Um, you know, created sort of our own little cult, <laughs> if you will. But it was, it was just so much fun. Wow, JB, what are your key takeaways from this conversation with Valerie Oberly? Yeah, Rebecca, um, I got to work with Valerie Oberly, and what I learned again in this interview from her is that leadership is all about relationships. I mean, she gained this very loyal following just by being genuine, 
attracting other talented and genuine people to join her. And it was, it was never fake. It was never transactional. And if you uh, can join a culture of people who really care about each other, then I just think everyone works harder because you want to keep this good thing going. And so for me, that's the takeaway. What, what did you think? Well, I think, you know, as leaders and as, and as humans, I would say it's common to second guess yourself. You know, if you're doing the right things, if you're spending what very little time you have where you should be. In this conversation with Valerie, confirm for me that if you are spending time with people, caring for them, developing them, taking care of them, that's exactly where you should be. Yep, total agreement. This is just a reminder to our listeners that this is part one of a two-part interview with Valerie Oberly. In our next episode, we're gonna learn more about what it was like for Valerie Oberly to be the first female executive, how she defines success, and her best leadership advice. So please tune in for part two of Leadership Life Stories interview with Valerie Oberly. See you soon. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. You can find Leadership Life Stories and all other Victor Media Group podcasts at victormediagroup.co. Leadership Life Stories was created by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell. Today's episode was co-hosted by Rebecca Morgan and J.B. Adams. Sound designed by Michael Orlowski, mixing and editing by Manny Simone. It's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, Follow us at Victor Media Group on your favorite social media platform. This is JB Adams, and until next time, remember, if you can dream it, you can do it.